Hey guys, it's Scott with Scotty B Cards, and in this video I want to talk all about the 1990s. I have a confession to make. I've been cheating on modern baseball. I've been collecting 1990s the last few months, and it's been a lot of fun. And in this particular video, what I wanna do is I actually wanna go over the 1990s and explain why I think it may be kind of a forgotten era. There's 90s collectors out there that love this era for good reason. And I wanna go over that in case you aren't super into these cards, because for me, it's been a great time getting to learn about them and enjoy them. So with that being said, I want have a few disclaimers. The very first one, I am not huge in this space. I am learning in this space. And while I know quite a bit, I do not claim to know everything. So if I say something that's not exactly on point for you 90s collectors out there, give me a break. I just want to help people be educated on the product. One thing I want to point out is that there is an option outside of vintage and ultra modern. People kind of forget that. And even kids that are younger kind of forget that. The 90s space can be great for players not named Griffey, Bond, and Derek Jeter. There's a lot of great buys out there. This is not going to become a 90s channel. If you don't like the 90s, still stay tuned if you're still watching because it's great to know about the era and be educated. I own and collect Larry Walker primarily. This last little bit, I actually picked up a Gem Masters one of one Larry Walker, which is arguably his best card ever made. I've also picked up other cool cards of Larry Walker. Like here is a Precious Metal Gem and here is a Red Crusade. Like I've picked up some cool stuff that I really like, but that does not mean you should collect them. Them. I need to make that abundantly clear. I am not saying they are a good buy. I am a Rockies fan and I'm wearing Rockies gear with the Rockies thing back here, a pennant. And so take that with a grain of salt. With that being said, disclaimers out of the way, this is why I think 1990s cards are great. Here's a few reasons. The very first one, the designs are fresh, unique, and actually, they actually tried. The art is great on these cards. It's extremely different than modern cards. Nowadays with Prism and Topps Chrome, Topps Chrome much to a lesser extent. Let's talk about Prism. Now with Prism and other football and basketball sets with Penny, they are the same looking things every year and they aren't that great. Modern baseball does a much better job in my personal opinion, but it does nothing compared to the 90s. All the cool inserts, a majority of the cool inserts nowadays are just remakes of the cards in the 90s. Like the man insert, they redid this in 2020. They did the same thing with with best performers in 2018 where they were copying 1998 Bowman's best. It's just one of those things where this is where we saw unique designs, unique parallels, beautiful cards that was art focused, but also rare. And that's what makes this era cool. And one thing I really like about it, regardless of who you collect, you can appreciate the design of these cards. I'll point out a few of these cards real quick for those that don't know. This is not gonna be super educational in regards to the specific type of cards. I'll talk about in a section of this video where you can go to find information on these cards. But right here is a the man refractor out of 75. There is no parallel lower than this. There was actually the man insert in 1998 Topps Finest Series 2. And in that set, the, the man inserts were out of 500. They were hard to pull and the man refractors are numbered to 75. That's it. Super great checklist. There's a Larry Walker that I do own. There's also right here, 24 karat gold from Fleer. This is number 24. I believe it has like a little bit of actual gold in it, if I'm not mistaken. And that's why it has a great shine. Over here, we have essential credentials. These are total. There's a now and a future. I don't know which is which, but they're total to 101. And so depending on where you're at in the checklist, you have more of one of them. So there's two versions. It's kind of confusing, but once you learn about it, it makes total sense. Down here is Red Crusade. These Red Crusades, I have a walker that I just showed. Those were only found in Don Russ and Leaf products, and it wasn't a primary product. They were inserted in four different sets across those brands as like super rare inserts. There was a green out of 250, a purple out of 100, and the red crusade out of 25, which makes this card one of the most sought after. Then we have precious metal gems, very common across football and basketball. In 1998, it was the first year of baseball. We did not have a 1997 precious metal gem. There was a metal universe in 1997, but not a precious metal gem. And these cards have a mountain background. This is actually my Larry Walker right here. I showed it, but you can see it right here better. And it has a scope design number to 50. Great card. Then we have Star Rubies, just a great looking card. I believe those are number to 50 as well. So this is kind of what you can see with the 90s. They took the technology they had and made it look great. There was more competition straight up. You had Fleer, you had over here Victory, you had uh, like Metal Universe, you had Bowman's Best, you had Select, you had Topps Chrome. Like I know some of these are owned by the same company. I understand, but not all of these were owned by the same company. Like even Sky 
buy box down here that has helped actually challenge each other to create a good product. We don't have Topps just releasing 50 different random products just to kind of make a little bit of money. Back then, these products actually challenged each other and that actually created more new types of cards. And that's what makes this era so special as well. Things changed rapidly and there were unique things that came and went real fast, which creates really crazy demand for some of the cards. There was also the introduction of relics, autographs, parallels, refractors, all numbered cards, all these different things happened in the 90s. That is where this began. It was the infancy of these things. And because it was the infancy of these things, they were not overprinted. I know the 90s may be overprinted, but the actual cool stuff wasn't. And that's one thing I love about this era. You can identify specific sets, you can identify specific runs, you can identify specific things that are special, unique, and rare. And that's completely different than now, besides rookie cards, people don't care about second, third, fourth, fifth, six year cards. And outside of the top five rookie cards, it's not as special. And I say don't care. I mean, like everybody can agree on one thing. That's kind of what I mean. And in regards to value too, but like here is actually 1996. This is select certified. This was the gold mirror. These were limited to 30. There was a couple different mirror variants. I believe one of them was out of 40. Well, not numbered, but stayed out of 40. And one is out of 100. Then there was a couple other parallels that weren't the mirror version. But these are some of the most sought after cards in all of baseball card collecting. I don't believe that extends in other sports because it was more confusing, but baseball cards, they love this card as well as the Red Crusade. Like those, those are huge. But this was kind of the first different parallel run of a product. This is in 1996, and that's why those are so sought after. Then over here, we have the game jersey. This is of Tony Gwynn. This is from Upper Deck in 1997. I want to say 97, might be 98. These were the first baseball game used cards, I believe. I could be wrong, but I believe that's the case. If not, it's one of the most early baseball game used cards, and those go for a ton because it's the first time they did it, and it's a cool design with kind of the pinstripes in the background. It's a unique thing they tried. Over here, we have 93 Tops Finest. This is the first refractor. Here's a Barry Bonds. Those first refractors, they're obviously what kind of led to where we're at today in the hobby. We had the introduction of 101s in 1997 Flair Showcase, which is great. This is, there's actually three different rows. There was, I believe, row two, row one, and row zero. There's a one of one of each of them, but these are the first, basically, one of ones. That's where that came from. Then down here, this is actually the first Reggie Jackson autograph, well, the first autograph in packs, which was Reggie Jackson, I believe, in 1990. So this goes back a little bit further, but we see a lot of advancements in actual autographs. This is a 94 between Mantle and Griffey. There's actually just a version with just Mantle and a version with just Griffey. And there's a version with both. Like there's all these different things. So that is cool. That's what I like about this era is it is where everything that the hobby is now was pure and where it came from and they were rare. And that's what's cool about them. Rookie cards are not as important in this era. And that is a good or a bad thing. And the reason for that is because a lot of these players, they have debuted in the early 90s or the late 80s, where the most rare version may be like a bazooka rookie card for Todd Helton, or you have the OPG or the Tiffany for Larry Walker, or for other players like Ken Griffey Jr. I believe he had a Tiffany in tops, but his actual upper deck is more important. And it's just confusing and it's not as important as it is these more rare inserts and parallels and specific sets. And that's what's cool about this product is all the players in specific sets we can all agree on are kind of sought after. And that's unique and different than we see in modern cards where we're looking at basically just rookie cards. And we do have those breakthrough sets. Yes, we see it with 2012 Prism. We see it with, I would say, 2016 Topps Chrome Sapphire with the out of five uh, gold parallels. Like there's things like that, but you can agree Precious Metal Gems. You can agree Red Crusades. You can agree the 24 Karat Fleer Brilliance. You can agree on other things. And they're actually outselling rookie cards. So there's only a couple of rookie cards here. Here is the one of one, well, pop one, not even a one of one. It's a graded card that makes it rare. But right here, you can see Rookie Card Cangraphy Jr. It's the gold pristine label, but it's the base 1989 upper deck. I know that's an important card. I know that's a tough card to get centered and in good condition. Over here, we have a Bowman Tiffany 89 Griffey rookie card. It's a pop one, which is why I went for so much. But we see other cards that are cooler to look at and from these specific sets that are important. There are easily identifiable sets to target for these players. So here is a couple different posts. I'll put these links in the description of this video where they said, what's the best 90s baseball insert of all time? Everybody voted. And yes, it's spread out, but we can see Red Crusade. We can see essential credentials like I discussed, Metal Universe, Precious Metal Gems. Down here is the 1996 Mirror Golds and so forth. So you can get an idea of what to look for and it can take time. And I'd highly recommend knowing what you're doing before you start buying because it's expensive and you need to know what you're actually targeting. But there's a lot of great resources out there and these players across the 
the whole set are collected. There's a lot of set collectors in this era where they go for the entire run, and so some of the more sought after players can be valuable, which makes it unique and interesting. Smaller rainbows, huge deal. Usually only one or two parallels of a card, which is great, and it makes it more fun to collect, in my opinion. These are the two essential credentials. Um, one of these two is like out of just a few, another one's out of more to a total to 101. But overall, that is a great thing about this era as well. And one thing that, and one thing that is important, and I think that will matter more in baseball and football, is the continuity between sports of these products. So here is Precious Metal Gems. Here's a Sheffield, the Brett Favre, Michael Jordan. It is the Precious Metal Gem, and it matches across sports. That helps other collectors and other sports come over to your sport, and they can help other people want your cards versus basketball collectors coming to baseball. Like, what are all these sets? And baseball collectors going to basketball. Like, these cards are horrible. This is something specific. Here's Star Rubies across all the sports. Here is the 24 karat Flare Brilliance right here as well. Super collectors are extremely common in this era. Like some of these cards never show up. And when they do, the super collectors gobble them up. Here's an example of what happened with the Barry Larkin Red Crusade out of 25. Went for auction for $5,000 because only one authentic one had sold. There are a lot of prototype bankruptcy copies out there, but this was the only one sold on eBay that I can find through Card Ladder. And so people paid a premium for this raw card from this era, which surprises a lot of other people. And one thing I'll note is I could see a shift happening. Here's my YouTube audience. Shout out to the 4.4% women who watch my channel. You're the best for doing that. Thank you. Because 96% is usually male, uh, my current audience. But we can see a majority. So right here is 15.5, 19.5. 19.6 is below 34. The actual 80% is above 35. And that 35 to 65 plus individuals, that grouping, they grew up watching the 90s and they really cared about the 90s. And so I could totally see a shift of that happening to the era we watched, especially because right now we're not in a great place with all the sets, all the different things going on. So that's something I've noticed. One thing I wanna warn you about, artificial pumping is extremely easy in this era from what I've heard and seen. People can really inflate prices of sets, not just specific players' cards, but sets in general real easily by manipulating the markets because they're so rare. There are a ton of fakes, backdoor copies, executive copies, and all that type of stuff that tricks collectors. Forgive me that this warning sign is over the text here. And there are so many different cards to go after. So that's another warning. There are a ton of cards to go after. Do not just dive head first and start buying. Take some time, do some research, identify what you want to purchase before you do it. And the bottom one, I actually have a miner in real estate that I've never used. I got it because I got my finance degree and the real estate electives are what I chose. I like real estate and never used it, never will. But but they always talk about the three rules, location, location, location. Well, this is research, research, research before you do anything and before you make a mistake. So the 90s, in the comments down below, if you'll ever try out this era, I have, it's fun. Again, don't buy the guys I like because I like them. I'm a Rockies fan. Buy guys you liked, that you liked watching. And if they're expensive, go venture into other players you cared about and enjoy this era. Don't go nuts. Just have fun with sports cards. If you're burnt out of modern, this is a great place to turn your attention for a little bit and to dive into. Other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.